morning, everybody. Um, thanks for making it out here today, um, braving both the coronavirus fears and the action in the market today. Um, it feels a little weird up here to be up here doing hidden gems and rising stars. Um, it's a PowerPoint I do uh, basically uh, that looks at some of the ETFs that we have found uh, punch above their weight in terms of getting flows uh, or ones that we think have lo a lot less assets than they should. I go to the money show, I present in all different areas, and I find that when I do sort of, uh, when I do presentations about the lay of the land and the industry, um, people will come up and ask me for tickers I went over. And they'll be like, well, would you go over EEM? What was that? So I'm like, okay, let me just go over tickers. So I feel like a lot of people coming to this are looking for trade ideas, interesting tickers, uh, things they might not know about that are practical. So that's what this presentation is about. And feel free to ask questions as we go. This is very casual. There's not a lot of people here, obviously. Um, and so all I do all day is eat, breathe, and, and sleep ETFs. I've been doing it for about 15 years. Um, I manage a group of about four analysts for Bloomberg under the, in the department called Bloomberg Intelligence, which is all research. That's all I do. And in our group, we look at new launches. We give reviews of them. We look at trends in the market. Like today, we're looking at how ETFs are holding up in the stress. A lot of ETFs are seeing a lot of volume when you have a day like today. Are any of them trading at, you know, uh, where their price is away from their NAV? Because a lot of people have their eyes on ETFs. Can these things really handle stress? Are they okay for investors? We've seen them handle the dot-com bubble. We've seen them handle 2008. We've seen them handle 2018. And they're now handling what I'm calling Corona apocalypse uh, pretty well. So uh, they largely do well. Usually you might find one issue here or there, but pound for pound, they're great products. Uh, they're very cheap. They're very easy to use, easy to find. Anybody has access and they deliver a lot to your front door. So with that, let me go over my presentation, which is just to you know, give you a little bit on uh, what we're seeing in the market and then some uh, due dill tips. And then I'll go over my, I have 20 tickers for you uh, to go over today. Uh, so overview, look, uh, the big trend in asset management is this chart. You've got ETFs and index funds are the top two bars. That's called passive. The bottom is active. So we see this huge move out of active mutual funds into passive products. And the number at the top is the return of the S&P that year. So this trend is, is irrelevant of what the market's doing. Some people think this is just because, oh, the market's been very easy for the past 10 years. But 2018 showed the shift to passive was just as big, even though the market was down. We think that a bear market will be even worse for active. A lot of people are trapped in those mutual funds by capital gains they didn't want to realize. Um, and in addition, active, mon active funds tend to not do any better outperformance-wise in bad markets. You'll see this year, let's say the market's down 12% this year, you'll find a third of active will do better, like any other year. So two-thirds will do worse, whether you're up or down. This trend is, I'd say, in the third or fourth inning. I think we're probably halfway to an equilibrium between active and passive. And really what this trend is all about is uh, low cost. This is a chart showing the percentage of flows that go to products that charge less than 0.20% or 20 basis points. It's now 99% of all the money being invested in this country is going to products that are what we call dirt cheap. This to me is the mother of all trends. Everybody uh, can get on board with this. Who doesn't want to? Nobody wants to pay a lot for their fun, right? So this is also what we call the Vanguard effect. And this is a big deal and something that seems to dictate a lot of the flows. And this is not good for the industry. A lot of the money is moving out of active, out of hedge funds, into ETFs and mutual funds. That's how much each of those areas makes in revenue. The good news is the lower their bar, the bigger your bar. So that's essentially what's happening here. As I say to people, the retail host organism that the asset management industry has been living off of uh, isn't just awake, it's pissed off. It's like, I can't believe I paid all this money for these funds all these years, let me go cheap. Um, and a lot of the products that the money goes to is what we call the core wars. These are products that make up the core of your portfolio, the S&P 500, the MSCI IFA, like the international developed, the emerging markets, and then the aggregate bond. A lot of people might have that as 70% of their portfolio. All those ETFs charge almost nothing. In fact, Bank of New York this week is rolling out 0.00% fee core ETFs. So you're, you're literally going to pay nothing for that. This presentation isn't about those. I, I'm going to assume that the, we all know those are great, they're cheap. I don't need to you know, 
highlight those because you probably already know about these products. BlackRock has a suite, Vanguard has a suite, they all have suites of these products. So I figured that would be a little boring. So I'm gonna go over some, some products that are a little left to center, a little different. Um, and to do due diligence on ETF, just a couple tips. This is a lot of what we do. I wrote a book on this called The Institutional ETF Toolbox, which really gives you great advice on how to do due diligence, how, and I take you through all the asset classes and categories a little bit in the same way I'm about to do today. Um, you know, choosing an ETF is like choosing a pair of shoes. There is no right or wrong ETF. It depends on what you're looking for. So I had my neighbor the other day go, oh, you cover ETFs. Uh, give me a tip. I'm like, like a stock tip. And I'm like, I, what are you looking for? <laughs> so I think that the investor needs to know what they want. Once you know what you want, boy, can ETFs hook you up. You could also peruse and try to maybe find something you're interested in. That's what I'm going to do for you today. I'm going to show off a bunch of different ETFs and maybe you like some, maybe you don't. But I do think if you want something, like say today you think energy is going to bottom out. I want an oil-related equity ETF. Okay, well, do you want one that covers the big ones like XLE or do you want one that covers the smaller mid-caps like XOP or, or XEL or what is it, XLE? Um, those would be a little more volatile, but they'd have more pop on the way up. You get the idea, right? So, but you would have an idea at that point, and then you'd have a couple ETFs to choose from. But I don't really judge anybody for using any ETF. There is no right or wrong. I think you just want to look at what they hold, what they cost, how, what the volume is, um, what the standard deviation is. You know, how risky are they? How how crazy is the roller coaster going to be? And then rate. There's some ratings out there um, which you could you could also use. But I think the first four you can find on any fact sheet. The iShares website, you know, if you don't have a Bloomberg, if you have a Bloomberg terminal, you're set, you're hooked up. But you can also get this stuff on ETF.com, Morningstar. Um, there's a lot of uh, ETF trends, has some good stuff. Anyway, so here's our, a function that we use for this. Uh, and you can just see all the different emerging markets ETFs here. So there's, there's like 100, or sorry, there's 2,200 ETFs total. Every category has 100 now, so there's a lot to choose from. And don't ever trust the name. That's the golden rule for ETFs, okay? Don't trust the name. For example, the Global X Social Media ETF is half or 40% emerging markets. You wouldn't know that. It sounds like this kind of cute name, but it's got a lot of Russia and China in there, which is good. They have uh, social media too, but you may not want to buy it because of that. Then you've got the iShares Large Cap China. That's 50% state-owned banks. Um, there's other China ETFs that are more diversified now. Then you've got the Middle East and Africa ETF, which is 78% South Africa alone. So they might as well just call it the Africa ETF to, be, to save the time. Um, and then the gold fund, that one doesn't hold gold in a vault like GLD. That one holds futures. So you wouldn't know that from the name. And then the water resources, some people think this holds water in a tower, like the way gold holds, GLD holds gold bars in a vault, uh, but it doesn't. Uh, this is going to be utility companies. So you might have sensitivity to rates. So that's one thing you should consider there. If you look at an ETF's expense ratio, essentially this is the reason people care about the expense ratio is because it's like a termite in your total returns. The bigger the fee, the bigger the termite, because that's what the fund company nibbles out. So you want to keep it small, so that way you keep your termite problem small. Um, and the expense ratio, an ETF's only goal in life is to track an index, right? And the expense ratio is what the ETF will miss the index by. And so the lower the fee, the closer you get to the pure index. Now, in terms of liquidity, look, most people look at volume. How much does it trade every day? 50 ETFs, um, so yeah, about 50 ETFs make up 75% of all the trading volume. In other words, everybody seems to use SPY, IWM, EEM. But there's plenty of ETFs you can use. You don't really need to let volume be your only decider for liquidity because a market maker can use the underlying holdings to make a market for you. They can just access those stocks. So if the stocks and the bonds in the ETF are liquid and the ETF doesn't trade a lot, you still should get a good spread. I would use a limit order, um, but there's a lot of volume and equality in ETFs. But you don't need to use the same 10 ETFs that came out in 1995, which a lot of people do. Um, and here's a, a case of where I talked about ETFs will see a lot more volume. Those 50 ETFs that trade the most, boy, do they get traded even more on days like today. So SPY traded $113 billion of shares last Friday, the most ever for any security. And you can see it was more than Volmageddon, Black Monday 2, and the Great Financial Crisis. 
So more and more, I think the, those 50 are going to be relied upon in a crisis. But again, you don't need to rely on them for your whole portfolio. And so some of the ones I'm going to go over today aren't in those top 50. Um, okay, risk. How risky is the ETF? So a very easy measure to use is standard deviation. Uh, this is something that if you look at different ETFs, the standard deviation tells you that based on past performance, there's a two-thirds chance that the ETF will be up or down this amount. So you take a bond ETF has a standard deviation of 4%, meaning the likelihood it's going to go up or down 4% in the next year based on the past performance. Okay. You look at a merger ARB fund, sounds scary, but it's actually not that volatile, only 4%. A lot of hedge funds are actually not as vol volatile as you think. But then a junk bond ETF would be 7%, a little more, right, than the treasury or the aggregate bond. Then you get the S&P is about 18%. I use the S&P as kind of like a reference point. Then I look for the standard deviation around that. Like, you know, it's kind of like skiing. You know, you know this one slope is like that. So I know the S&P is about like this type of a ride. And then I'm going to go off of that. So the bond, you know, is going to be way like a bunny slope, right? And then you go from there. Now, the Russell 2000, that's the small caps, that's going to be 25%. And then you go to a zero coupon bond ETS, which strips out the coupon. Those are going to be more volatile than a normal treasury. Then you get to like Brazil small caps, right? So now you're talking about double the S&P in terms of volatility. The VIX is going to be very volatile. Uh, leverage ETFs are going to be really volatile. And then we have JNUG, a freak of nature, the most volatile security on the Bloomberg terminal, meaning it will likely go up 125% or down. <laughs> Can't go down that much. But uh, this is the uh, idea of uh, putting triple leverage on junior gold miners. Anyway, you get the idea. So I love standard deviation. There's many risk measures to use, but standard deviation is a pretty good one, pretty simple. And I have found it to pretty much work consistently. Okay, let's go over the tickers now. Here's a list of 10 tickers that uh, are, you know, they pretty much went from oblivion to the big time in, quick, in a quick process. In other words, they're seeing outsized flows, a lot of interest. A lot of them are just crossing that billion dollar mark. This would be like rookies of the year, you know, that, that kind of thing. So these are ones where the audience is voting on them. And I'm trying to tell you, this is what advisors and, and people are picking in, in, in mass. They like these ones. Number one, if you're looking for treasuries, and treasuries have been a great place to be lately, GOVT people like because it doesn't pick a part of the curve. It invests in the whole thing. So you own the whole treasury curve in one shot. And you own it for 15 basis points. The expense ratio is that number in the lower right-hand corner. Yeah. And so you can see it's got 14 billion. It had 7 billion a year ago. So it's doubled its assets. And you can see the duration here. It holds uh, all over the curve. So again, very simple, very cheap, but effective way to buy treasuries. And you can see that organic growth there. Those green bars are pure net flows. Okay, the JP Morgan Ultra Short Income ETF. So a lot of people will use a money market fund as their cash, right? But they have a nav of one and they yield almost nothing. So what what people are now doing, advisors, is they're going, you know what? We don't want interest rate risk, but we don't want to put it in a money market fund. Let's put it into one of these short duration or ultra short duration treasury uh, bond ETFs that is actively managed. So they basically turn it over to JP Morgan or a PIMCO. They have Mint. And they're going to basically look at the uh, bonds that mature within a year. But they're going to use corporates, maybe some international. They're going to squeeze out a little more yield and a little more return for you. So you get, I, I call it like a money market fund with a kick. So it's a little extra risk, but again, you're not having interest rate risk here. What you're doing is taking a touch more credit risk. And some people want to have that. And you can see it's 18 basis points. JP Morgan's active managers are running this for you. This is one of the rare cases in the ETF world where active management is popular. Advisors really like to turn it over to bond managers. They think that with bonds, there's way more bonds. They're harder to figure out. You've got the rate of component. They, they mature, so you've got time. It's almost like it's more three-dimensional chess. The equity side, most people just go passive now. So this is part of, I bring this up because of uh, the advisor value add here for this one. And you can see here that it's all very short duration. You can see it is 67% corporate bonds. So it's not all treasuries. 
So it's not it's not a money market fund, but it's uh, you know it, it's it, it again it's like a little spicy version of one. And you can see the flows in there. These products are very hot. JPST isn't the only one. Mint is another one. That's the Pimco one. If you like their brand. Okay, now Goldman Sachs large cap beta. Uh, you've heard of smart beta. That's basically like, hey, let's take actives. Let's look at the ways active has gotten alpha in the past but we'll convert it into an index. We'll make an index out of the strategy. So this is GSLC, and it's very popular because look, it charges nine basis points. You're paying passive prices for something that's going after four factors at once. Momentum, value, quality, and size. And those four factors are known to, over time, produce extra, a little bit of alpha for you. So Goldman says, don't try to pick them. We'll go after all of them. But they're not going to take too much risk. It's going to look a lot like the market. They're just trying to eke out maybe an extra 1% a year. Uh, advisors eat this thing up, man. They love this strategy because A, it's cheap. B, it's Goldman. C, it's the sort of newfangled quant investing thing. And it serves all four factors up at once. They don't want to try to pick or time factors. So that's, a, that's been another very popular one. And you can see the PE is 22. It's about the same as the S&P. And you can see the flows into this thing have been very consistent. Um, the iShares Core Total Bond ETF. So remember how I told you about the total treasury with the one that went over the whole curve? Um, a lot of people will use that uh, AGG, the AG, as their core bond area uh, for their portfolio. But the, the wrap on the AG is it's very highly leaning towards treasuries, and it doesn't have any high yield or international. So it's almost like the boring part of the bond world, right? And a lot of active managers in the bond space are good at beating the ag because they just take on a little extra credit risk in high yield or a little international and they can beat it. This basically is the ag plus I think 5% high yield and 5% international and it tracks more bonds. So it's a deeper, wider net. It's almost like a broader take of the bond market. And for six basis points, you will get a lot of bond exposure. It's probably preferable to the ag. And if you look at active bond managers and you compare them to the ag, 60% will beat the ag, but only 30% beat this. To me, this is a little bit more of a better benchmark for bond managers as well. But that's a popular ETF that is up and coming. You can see it's got about $4 billion. Um, ARC Innovation. Anybody here uh, follow Kathy Wood uh, from ARC? She's on CNBC a lot. She's Famous, she's a woman with glasses, and uh, she's famous for basically saying Tesla would go to $4,000 uh, in five years, and then she actually upped her, her target. But she was basically um, uh, made, uh, she was vindicated because Tesla went on that like massive run, probably down a little bit in the past two weeks, but she was vindicated. Anyway, long story short, even before that call, this ETF has been very popular. It's basically Kathy Wood picking disruptive companies, right? So these are going to be biotech names. They're going to be tech names. They're going to be um, things, different companies across sectors that have one thing in common. They're disrupting their industries. And it's very concentrated, only 25, 30 stocks in there. And so she has about a 99% active share to the S&P. This is what we think the future of active is. Because what's the sense in buying like a large cap fund that just takes a little tiny risk, right? You can get that for free in a large cap ETF now for like free. So here is something very different than the benchmark. Again, I would call this fund like hot sauce. So let's say you had a cheap core, you would just sprinkle a little of this on to maybe try to get a little alpha. And she's done very well, and she's persisted in 2018 when the market was down, she did better too. She's been able to like uh, do better in downturns. So it's my, you know, kind of a uh, case for active here. One of the blueprints is to just go, you know, all out, concentrated, convicted, bold. And that is the sort of uh, what, what has attracted investors to her. She's outperformed too. I would, I would say she probably wouldn't be as popular if she didn't do the outperformance. Small cap value. Uh, Michael Burry from the Big Short came out about six months ago, said a bunch of stuff. And one of the things he said was, I like small cap value. Uh, it's an area of the market that just has been completely lagging the rest of the market. And there's a bunch of ETFs that track small cap value. Um, now, I will say in this past sell-off, they, they haven't really popped. Um, but I just point this out to you guys. 
If you want a basket of small cap value stocks, this is a pretty good ETF to do it. 15 basis points, and this would get you all those stocks. Because again, this is, I think, the benefit of an ETF is if you're you know, retail and you don't have time to research all small cap value stocks, you can just buy them all at once. Um, this will limit your upside, but it will limit your downside too because you'll be diversified. But I would say small cap value is one of the more uh, volatile areas. So it, this isn't exactly like safe per se, but I bring it up because this is a, a very dirt cheap product that tracks this area. People seem to like it uh, for that purpose. Okay, uh, marijuana. <laughs> um, look, MJ, there's a couple of marijuana ETFs on the market now. MJ was the first one. Now, MJ um, had a great run and then it had a bad run. And so this is a very volatile area. Some people have equated marijuana now like to the end of prohibition. And so I, I'm mixed, I don't know. I don't know where it's going. Um, all I know is that if you have a market that was underground and it gets brought to the surface, uh, you should have some revenue there. Just, we don't know who's gonna be the winners and losers. So this is another case where I think the ETF makes some sense because you don't necessarily know which of these stocks is gonna be the next one acquired or you know shoots to the moon or one that, get, that blows up. And so you buy the basket, you own them all. So MJ's become pretty popular. YOLO is another one. Uh, this is the area with the best tickers, by the way. YOLO uses swaps to get multi-state operators, which is the one part that the SEC won't let them invest in. Multi-state operators are the people who actually like sell the actual weed in the stores. So if you want those companies too, YOLO has those. Um, MJ doesn't. Because uh, there's some issues with the legality of pot right now. It's federally illegal. Some states it's legal. Uh, so YOLO will be one if you kind of want to go for the gold. Um, and then Toke is another one that come out, has come out, it's active, and it has a lot less uh, volatility because it ends to, goes more, more towards bigger cap stocks. So if you don't have the stomach for volatility, Toke is actually decent uh, for that purpose. But MJ also has a lot of Canada in it. When you buy a marijuana ETF, you're going to get a good chunk of Canada in there. And you can see there's been some flows into it. Um, it's interesting, marijuana ETFs, when they do bad, Normally, a theme ETF, when it starts to underperform, people will pull their money out. It's fickle money. It's performance chasing, but not here. I think either people forgot, you know, could be some people uh, just, you know, forgot they bought it, or are, I think, all in on the story. So the marijuana ETFs have been stickier. The assets have been stickier than in normal cases, which is, tells you there's a base of support for this story. Okay, gold. Gold is probably popular and will be for the next couple of weeks, I'm sure. GLD is the one everybody knows, but the GLD people came out with the GLD Mini-Me. Does the exact same thing, but for less than half the cost. So it's 18 basis points instead of 40. There is no reason to use GLD when this exists. That's an easy one. And I'm not alone. The advisors have figured this out pretty quickly, and they're now going into it pretty quickly. So cheap gold. Um, this is a Wisdom Tree Yield Enhanced Aggregate Bond ETF. Like The way I went over... IUSB is sort of like a better way to squeeze out extra uh, to broaden your bond exposure. This is say, let's just use the bonds that are in the ag, but let's rearrange them in a way to try to squeeze out some more yield because the ag doesn't yield, yield a lot. So if you want to have the same exact sandbox as the ag, but tilt and, and maneuver a little to get more yield, this does it. Um, and I think that's a good way to apply smart beta, right? because bonds e indexes tend to be weighted by the amount of debt outstanding. So smart beta comes along and says, that's not a good way to weight them. Let's actually weight them a different way. So I think smart beta has some good value out on the, on the bond side. And that, that's what this does. And advisors have caught on. It's only 12 basis points too. Finally, USMV, this is the iShares uh, minimum volatility ETF. This one's probably the most famous of the ones on this list. It's a 34 billion. It's, it's a monster at this point. What this does is BlackRock put together this, this ETF that basically tries to give you the market, but take about 15% off the volatility. And it doesn't just do it by going after low volatility stocks. That's what SPLV does. And by doing that, you end up with utilities and staples mostly. And the wrap on that is I don't want to own utilities and staples in order to be low vol because they have rate risk. Um, also, I'm now concentrated in a bunch of sectors. So iShares came along and responded to that by saying, okay, we're gonna give you all the sectors 
evenly, so it's going to look like the S&P in terms of the sector breakdown, but we're going to use stocks that offset it from each other. So if we know this one goes up when this one goes down, we're going to put those in there together, and that will help bring the overall volatility down. So people have really bought into this, advisors in particular, because they have older investors who don't want that volatility. And we have found in sell-offs and in regular markets, you will get a, a smoother ride here. Um, and occasionally it will outperform, but it could also underperform a little bit. So you have to accept that sort of you know, little wave around the S&P's performance, but you will get a, a smoother ride going there. And that's why that's a huge hit. I also think low vol and minimum volatility is like selling, it's easy to sell, it's like Diet Coke. I want the taste, but I want less calories. And I think that's the ultimate, what this is, how this is being packaged. It's easy to explain. A lot of ETFs get popular because they're easy to explain. The ones that might be very valuable that an institution might like, like that merger ARB one I talked about earlier, it's actually a pretty interesting one. It just takes a long time to explain what it does, and I think that's where they, you can kind of overshoot the whole retail and advisor market if you're an ETF issuer. We call it the dead zone. When someone takes an institutional hardcore strategy, tries to democratize it, it can just fall flat, even though I'm like, wow, this is a pretty good deal. You're getting the strategy for half the cost of what a hedge fund would do, but like nobody cares. This is the exact opposite. This one uh, is a huge hit because it's easy to explain. The volatility number is there. It does what it does and cheap. It's also under 20 basis points, that magic number. Um, and you can see the flows. Okay. Now I got 10 ETFs real quick. I think we're, oh yeah, we're, I got to end pretty, you know, I started 1045. Yeah, we've, okay, perfect. Uh, about a minute each year for these. These are 10 ETFs that our team, the research team, we're just surprised they don't have more assets. So this would be like somewhat my opinion, our opinion baked in. Um, we just go, man, we kind of kick the tires on our work. It's a pretty good idea. Uh, we're surprised that nobody's really kind of come in and, and uh, you know, grabbed hold of this thing. The first is the MSCI All China Equity ETF. CN is the ticker. The reason we think this is so useful is China, because they didn't allow foreign investors in their country for so long, there's all kinds of share classes there. There's A shares, which only the mainland residents can buy. Then there's H shares that list in Hong Kong. Then there's like uh, P chips. Then you've got companies like Alibaba that are domiciled in the Cayman Islands, but then they list primarily in the US so they can be missed from some indexes. CN comes along and says, you know what, screw all that. We're gonna put all of them in one index. And we're going to have it weighted by the market cap. So it's about 50% A shares, which only mainland residents buy pretty much. A little bit of H, a little bit of P chips. So you basically get everything. And that's good because your tech exposure goes up. That's the hot area in China. Whereas FXI, the big one in the category, has almost no tech. Mostly banks, state-owned government. They don't run. So CN is like hitting the easy button for China. And it only has 37 million. We just find, we just shocked by that. Our theory is... People owned FXI, and then when the A share ASHR came out to track A shares, maybe they added that, and they don't necessarily want to sell both to buy this. That's our guess, is that it's just too you know, troublesome to go into this, but if you are looking for that one China solution, CN's, uh, I think, a good deal. FPX, this is an ETF that tracks IPOs on the, I think it might be the seventh day after they come out. So they let a little of the volatility you know, get out of the way. Then they buy it on day seven, and this one holds it for the first four years. So, and then it, it kicks it out. So I call it catch and release. And it's getting these IPOs in the toddler phase of their life. Because most indexes don't take a new IPO in for years, because it has to pass a bunch of these tests. So like, you know, for example, Facebook didn't get into the big indexes for three or four years. Um, so these ETFs basically go out and get an area. We like it for two reasons. One, it gets an area of the market that most indexes and ETFs don't cover, which is new IPOs. And it does it all in a diversified way. So you don't have to pick the winners from the losers, right? You just own all the new IPOs and you kick them out and that's the dot. We also like it because if we look at the return, this thing's beaten the market since it was launched in 20, 2006 by a good degree. And the reason is because a lot of IPOs crash and burn, right? But the, there's a couple that w there are blockbuster hits, like a Facebook or a Tesla, one of those guys, and you just need a couple of those blockbusters to totally overwhelm the dogs. And so that's what we found is behind the performance. 
of IPO and why it's outperformed. Facebook gave this thing so much juice before Facebook went into other funds. Now, Facebook's done good for those other funds, too. But this thing was the only thing that really got Facebook's younger years and, and squeezed the juice from that. And so that is, uh, I think, an interesting one. It's almost a billion dollars. So this is probably the largest one from this list. But given the performance and the consistent outperformance and the value add, tracking an area that doesn't have other, um, that you don't really get in any, any other ETFs, uh, we, we think it's largely uh, smaller than it should be. Okay, here's one called NERD. This is the video game ETF. There's a couple. There's Gamer, G-A-M-R. There's NERD. There's ESPO. They're all good. I think you get to just pick out what kind of uh, portfolio you want. So I just look at the holdings of those. But the video game industry is really fascinating to us. If I did it, you know those taste tests where you, the people taste the soda and they're like, they don't tell them what's Coke, Pepsi, and like Acme brand or whatever? If I gave you the numbers of the video game industry and the revenue growth and the number of users and da, 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 and I didn't tell you what industry it was, and then I gave you like robotics and we'll say, you know, a biotech or some other industry, I think you would be stunned at how much you were attracted to this industry. But then when I said it's called, it's the video game industry, you'd be like, oh, it's for kids. It is unbelievable the amount of interest in this area. They're, and especially esports, which is watching video games, they're now building stadiums just to watch them. Anybody with a kid knows what I'm talking about. Um, so this ETF goes out and tries to capture all these video game stocks. And look, a couple of them are already going to be in big indexes, like in Activision. But there's a lot of small ones here, and there'll be a lot of M&A. These small ETFs, these niche ones, what they're also good at doing, like the marijuana one, is you get M&A pop. Because you're going to hold a bunch of these small companies, and an, and an electronic arts might buy one of the smaller companies as they seek to get bigger. This happens in the biotech ETF a lot. And so by doing this, you sort of... You're sort of getting an area that just, again, isn't that represented in bigger ETFs. And again, I'm not saying the video game industry will go up or down. I'm just saying we looked at the numbers and we're like, wow, I can't believe all the video game ETFs total have maybe like 150 million. It's just not that much. And then robotics, which is a smaller industry and has had less growth, that, those have 4 billion. And our theory is the perception that when an advisor thinks of robotics, they think of that Boston robot jumping on the car, doing the dishes, and they're like, yeah, it's the future. Seems legitimate. They think of video games, they probably think of a 13-year-old doing this, and it just looks sad and, and like a toy. So we think there's a major perception, pointless perception issue between some of these industries. Um, cybersecurity is another one. The video game industry is bigger than that, and yet cybersecurity ETFs have about $2 billion. Anyway, just to... That's my take on that. Um, now, BTAL, this is a good one for when the markets go down. A lot of um, ETF hardcore users like BTAL. All BTAL does is it goes short the highest beta stocks. So, you know, the, the, the stocks that are the, the hot shots. And it goes long the real low vol stocks. So essentially, in a sell-off, the idea is High vol gets sold worse than low vol does, and you can pocket that difference. But largely speaking, I just think this is probably, if you're looking for a hedge in your portfolio that isn't a sort of inverse or double leveraged inverse, because those have some issues. You've got to trade those. You can't hold those. This is probably a good way to sort of provide a hedge for your portfolio, because it tends to go up when the market goes down. In 2018, I think these, the market was down 6%. These might have been up 14 so it's not going to, you know, give you serious pop, but it's also not going to do anything funky that leveraged and VIX ETPs would do. Um, the Goldman Sachs large cap equity ETF, Just. Um, you know, ESG is becoming very popular. Now, there's a lot of ESG ETFs. I find that they have some contradictions. Some own Exxon, some don't. Some don't own the FANG names. You know, so... You've got to really be careful what you're buying with ESG. And I think it's a subjective question. You know, what do you think, what are your values? We like Just because uh, Paul Tudor Jones made it. That's the hedge fund manager that everybody knows. And he made it because he surveyed America and said, what is important to you for corporate America to do? And number one was pay your workers a good wage. 
Number two was also worker related. You don't get to climate change till like five. And this holds Exxon because they treat their workers great and they check a lot of other boxes. And we put it out there because A, it's an alternative take on ESG, but B, it highlights how ESG is so different. You better really do, do your due diligence here because some of them might own Exxon, some might not. Some might value the climate change or the, you know, uh, that kind of thing more. And some just go after the E, some go after the S and the G. If you don't know, it's environmental, social, and governance. Those are the three things that make up an ESG ETF. But just as interesting to us, given that it's based on America's view of what companies should be doing in terms of how they, you know, their values. Okay, uh, the Alpha Architect quantitative value. Um, this guy, uh, Wes Gray, I've gotten to know, he is... He's the kind of guy who would be managing family office money, right? He'd be an institutional investor. He only came out with the ETFs because his clients are wealthy and ETFs are very tax efficient. So you get access to this kind of a, an investment strategy. Now, his fund is hard, what we call hardcore value, or he even calls it the blue meth, the good stuff. Because a lot of value ETFs will get cut with beta. In other words, they might market cap those stocks. And, and they might not give you that pop. When value actually comes back, this thing will give you the maximum amount of pop. Because in 2009, when value stocks came back, there was a 110% gap between the best performing value ETF and the worst. One was up like 134%, one was up 20%. This would be closer to the top. However, in times when the market's doing well and value's sucking, this is gonna lag a little. If you look at the portfolio, my guess is there's small stocks in there, I wouldn't be surprised if they rebalance into airline stock soon. So as he calls it, these are the dirtball stocks everybody hates. But that is what true value investing is supposed to be. But you gotta know the ETF issuers out there, um, the bigger ones especially, they'll take something like this, which is more of the pure factor strategy, and what they'll do is they'll commercialize it by adding in more beta, because then they can push it to advisors who don't want their clients to yell about anything that looks different than the S&P. The problem with that, though, is if everything looks at the S&P, you have no diversification. So I think, again, you have to decide what you want. I don't, if you want, if you can't handle like lagging for a couple years, you shouldn't do it. But we do find this is an interesting one given uh, the uh, you know, popularity of factors. And this one probably gets as close to the pure factor as any of them. Um, the cash cow ETF, if you talk to quants, they don't like price the book anymore. They think that ratio is all messed up. And uh, the, the metric that a lot of quants like today is free cash flow. So here is an ETF that looks at free cash flow, but it's free cash flow yield, which means it will tilt towards a little bit on the value side. There's another one for, that's free cash flow from, um, I can't remember, I'll think of it later, but that just goes straight free cash flow. But the yield is an interesting one because, again, it'll have a little value tilt to it, a little fundamental weighting. But free cash flow tends to be a metric that a lot of uh, quants look to today uh, in, in place of price the book and some other metrics. So I bring this up because this is the only, this is an ETF dedicated to nothing but the metric free cash flow. Some ETFs revolve their whole life around one metric. There was a company once uh, a couple years ago called Revenue Shares. And all they did was make a whole line of ETFs based on one metric, price the sales. He just swore that was the thing. So you'll find ETFs that, and then like GSLC, the one I went over earlier, that has four factors, 20 metrics each. That's about 80 metrics going to that one. You see these ETFs have all, all kinds of different areas. I think that gives me some job security because <laughs> it takes a long time to really suss out what's going on with these. Um, but I think, you know, you want to look at the holdings. I think they tell you a lot. If you recognize the names at the top, okay, it's probably market cap weighted, probably commercialized. It's probably made for advisors who don't want clients yelling at them. If you look at the top holdings, you don't recognize the names probably a little more hardcore, but we'll probably have a little more volatility. I think that's probably an easy way to put it. Now, the millennial ETF, this sounds like a joke. Um, and we, we laughed at it when it first came out. We're like, oh, come on. But then we actually thought about it, and it, it had a nice run, and I can't say it's done better than, say, the tech sector, but what we like about it, what we find interesting is it, it basically picks the stocks based on one main thing. Do the companies, does 50% of the revenue of the companies come from millennials? And you get some pretty techie companies in there from all sectors. And we like that because if you can serve a fickle, 
Again, you know how millennials are. Some are in here. You guys, you're very, you're very good with technology. And we feel like if millennials are like the early adopters of our society tech-wise, if you can please them, you're probably good for the long term. And I'd, I'd look through the holdings, make sure you want to own it. But this is a case where a silly sounding ETF actually has something interesting behind it that you could argue is, is a pretty good way to choose companies. On the flip side, we, um, we found things like the cloud computing ETF sounds really legit. But you know, you could argue that the firms in there that holds it's such a small percentage of the revenue from cloud computing that what's really the point? So anyway, these are some of the things you have to look at when you're looking at the theme ETF world. Africa. Um, look, every single continent has seemed to have a nice run now and then, except for Africa. It's just been in the gutter of the world for so long, return-wise. That said, there's a lot of hope. There's a lot of possibility and potential there. So if you want something that's just so beat up, I think this might have a P of 9. And uh, Nigeria, there's a Nigeria ETF, NGE. It's the cheapest in terms of P of any of them. I think the P is now 5.5. So if you are just really attracted to that like bargain basement, Africa, Nigeria, but again, you know, buyer beware. The, <laughs> the Nigeria ETF had a P of eight a couple years ago, and we, and we thought, oh man, it's how crazy, and it went down. <laughs> so it can, it can keep going down and down. So I, I point that out, but um, anyway, we think this one's an interesting holding, and Africa isn't all that represented in the emerging markets indexes. So if you like Africa, you're not getting a ton of it. You might get a little 12% of South Africa, but that's about it. And then finally, ZIV. Anybody remember XIV? That's the inverse vol VIX futures ETF, uh, ETP rather. Um, that shorts VIX futures. Now, today is the worst day to do that strategy because VIX futures are up. But largely, um, that strategy has worked, but the short term part of it, it's made it blow up. Um, it's made it, you know, lose a lot of money quickly. ZIV shorts the middle part of the curve. So it's a less volatile way, a safer way to short VIX futures. I almost don't bring this up because I don't want retail investors messing with this. This is a rated R product. I think most of the other ones I went over today would be PG and PG13, um, and even G. This is probably my only rated R uh, product today, but it is a way, when you, sell, when you sell volatility, it's almost like you're an insurance company selling insurance. You get a nice premium, but when there's a hurricane, you suck wind, right? So right now, sucking wind, but the premium over the years has made this thing a nice performer. Um, and because it shorts the middle part of the curve, which is less volatile, you don't have that moment where you're, bam, you're down 70% in a day. You wouldn't, this wouldn't go down that much. You get a little less premium, uh, though. So anyway, um, but if, uh, if that sounds a little confusing, don't mess with it at all. But I, I do bring it up because we are surprised it doesn't have more assets, especially from some of the trading crowd that really liked XIV. Um, if you have a terminal, this is where all my research is. And if you don't have a terminal, you can find me on ETFIQ, which is a Bloomberg TV show, every Wednesday at 1 p.m., um, and a podcast called Trillions, which is on ETFs, um, which you can get on Apple or anywhere. So those are two free ways um, to get me. And, oh, who put that in there? This is a picture of my book. That's another way. That's not free, though. Uh, it's not that bad. But this is a good book. If you want to learn more about ETFs, put my heart and soul into this. Um, and, uh, there, you know, people have given me good feedback. It says institutional, but it's more retail. It's more conversational, like the way I'm talking to you today. Um, but I do go over a couple tricks of the trade that institutions do for ETF usage, but largely it's a retail book. And then if you are on Twitter, you can follow me there. I post charts and whatnot there. Uh, in fact, I'll go back to tweeting today because there's a lot going on in the market and I've got to keep track of all the ETF action, see if anything's looking a little weird. Um, largely it's been pretty good. There's a couple halts, but that, that's not an ETF problem. That's just Bad, bad market day. Any questions before we wrap it up? Yeah. Yeah, on ETF IQ, we have a section called the life cycle. We go over the filing, which is the, you know, I'm pregnant. <laughs> then we go over the launch, baby born, and then we go over the liquidation, which is the end of the cycle. Although there's this new, we're adding another one for reincarnation because there, there's a new trend where they'll, like, first trust will, like, a couple companies will see an ETF not working. Instead of liquidating it, 
they'll just change the strategy and have a whole new life with it. And we call that reincarnation. So there's now four parts to the life cycle. And each week we cover those. Just to cover. Because there's, and it's about equal. For every death, there's a new filing. And then so it just keeps going and going. Any others? Yeah. Okay. It's tough because if you look at it, it's going to deviate a good, you know, a decent amount from the market. So, uh, you know, personally, when I think of thematic ETFs, especially ones that go for the gold, like millennials, I look at them as like seasoning or a condiment on a meal. I don't look at them as the meal. Um, I tend to me the portfolio of the future and of young people, and you can see it in TD Ameritrade and Fidelity when they put out like what people when they look at what millennials hold. A lot of them hold cheap Vanguard. When you look at millennial holdings by assets, it's all boring Vanguard. But then you look at millennial uh, holdings by trading, and it's all triple leveraged, whacked out stuff. So I think they, they like 80% cheap, you know, Vanguard, Wall Street, get your hands off my money. But then 20%, they like to just like trade on their phone and, and have a good time. So um, I also think the portfolio of the future that advisors are building is a low cost core Right, so you may be paying like eight basis points for 70, 80 percent of your portfolio, and then you would drop themes, maybe some smart beta, and maybe some um, you're into leverage again. Be careful, but some of those power tool type products on the with the 10, 20 percent money. Yeah, ETF is a 40 act fund, just like a mutual fund. SEC says boom, good to go, um, and it holds the securities. So all the stocks in the millennial fund are with a custodian, which is great because if Global X goes out of business, you still own the stocks. That's very good. ETN, whole different story. It's a note issued by a bank. So it just says, hey, we, we promise this note, we promise to give you the return of the index in 20 years. Um, now Lehman had an ETN and it went bank, it just went away. Uh, so there was nobody in it, thankfully, but an ETN has credit risk. But the reason people like ETNs is in places that track futures, because with an ETN, you get taxed normally, whereas if an ETF that holds futures, you get taxed like you own futures, or in MLPs. It's a real pain in the butt to hold MLPs in a fund because of taxation issues. An ETN doesn't have those. So for the most part, ETNs are largely used as a tax loophole at this point. They first came out uh, 15 years ago as a way to get places ETFs couldn't. And one of those was India. The first ETN was an India ETN because India wouldn't let you buy stocks there if you're a foreign government. So that, so we was like, okay, well, we can't hold the stocks. Let's do an ETN because we don't need all the stocks. But then now you can hold Indian stocks. Nobody wants the ETN. So if and when you can hold the stocks, all else equal, you would never use the ETN. The ETN is largely used for tax loophole purposes if you really, really want to buy something that holds futures like commodities or VIX or MLPs. There's about 25 billion and it hasn't really gone up or down in like 10 years. So, you know, and the credit risk, yeah, it's, it probably gets overblown a little, uh, given that if you asset weight all of the defaults, it's very minor. Lehman had one, I think Bear Stearns had one, but they had almost no assets. That said, it's a legitimate risk and it's something you have to consider, but ETNs are not regulated the same way. Anyone else? All right, well, thank you. I'll let you get back to the market chaos.